Thank you, worship team. We appreciate you guys. Well, today we're starting a new series through the book of 1 Corinthians, or the letter that's 1 Corinthians. And our journey doesn't actually start there, but it actually begins in Acts chapter 18. So if you have your Bibles, you can open to Acts 18, and this is kind of the founding story of the uh, church in Corinth. You know, many of us are familiar with the Jewish leader turned Jesus follower named Paul. And in Acts 18, he steps into the city of Corinth, probably for the first time. And I imagine his shoulders sagging a little bit. He's, he's frustrated. He's uh, discouraged. He's deflated. This trip has not gone according to plan. In Acts chapter 15, Paul and his close friend Barnabas split up. They, they go in a different direction because they, they, they can't work together. They have a kind of a, a sharp disagreement. So that's a bummer. And then in Acts 16, Paul goes to Philippi, and after an exciting start, uh, he gets beat up and thrown into prison and then uh, kicked, asked to leave the city. In Acts chapter 17, Paul goes to Thessalonica, and then after another good start, some of his fellow Jews fanatically stir up the whole city against him. The same thing happens in nearby Berea. The the Thessalonica Jews follow Paul there like a crazy (laughs) ex-girlfriend, slash his tires, uh, pretty much, and, um, and, and, and they make life miserable for him. Like, can you imagine if people were like following me around wherever I speak at church and just like heckling me? I mean, that would be uh, horrible, a disaster. Um, And remember, these are Paul's own people, his ethnic heritage, Jesus's own ethnic heritage, and they're actively opposing Paul's message. Uh, so Paul then goes to Athens. He talks to the Greeks. He's like, I need a break from the, 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 my own Jewish people here. He goes to talk to the Greeks. Things go okay. A few people are interested, but most just make fun of them. <laughs> Let's just hear what this babbler has to say. Now, we think Paul left Silas and Timothy in one of those other cities, so he's likely alone as he walks into Corinth, which probably isn't making things any easier. Now, what's the city of Corinth like? Old Greek Corinth uh, had a reputation like Las Vegas. Anything goes. <laughs> Go Raiders. <laughs> what happens in Vegas, uh, what happens in Corinth stays in Corinth. Uh, sexual looseness uh, and all that comes with that. But Greek Corinth got wrecked by the Romans. Just the city got leveled, totally destroyed. A hundred years later, Julius Caesar revives the city uh, shortly before his own assassination. Now, New Corinth, Roman Corinth, quickly regained its former prominence and some. It was big, cosmopolitan, up and coming. Uh, More than Las Vegas, this was something of a Silicon Valley or a New York uh, of the ancient world. And the main reason for this was its strategic geographic location. Um, Let's uh, show that first picture here. Um, So that's a modern picture of it, but you can kind of see, they call it an isthmus. I don't remember that from geography class, and I'm sure you don't either, but um, what what kind of the the, the strategic advantage of this geography is ships would much rather kind of go to Corinth and then um, transport the goods across land. It was much safer than the uh, storm, um, you know, the, the jagged coastline. And in fact, this is incredible, they would take some of the goods and even the ships and somehow move them on land across those two to four miles. Uh, it's almost like, like, how do they do this? A lot of slave labor. And um, today there's a canal there, which kind of shows you the strategic importance of that place. Uh, Clark and Cheyenne went there a couple weeks ago, right? You guys visited. Maybe we'll have you do a presentation. Uh, that'd be fun to hear about. But uh, the influx of commerce meant that the city was incredibly diverse. Uh, People from all over the Roman world would pass through, and it also made the city extremely wealthy. Well, for a few people. A select few people got really rich, and then, um, you know, there's this huge disparity between the wealthy elite and everyone else. So when Paul walks into Corinth, he looks for a job and a place to stay, and God really sets him up. Acts 18, verse 1 says, after this, he left Athens and went to Corinth. Remember that after this is all that bad stuff that I just talked about. 
where he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who recently came from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had ordered all the Jews to leave Rome. Paul came to them, and since they were of the same occupation, tent makers by trade, he stayed with them and worked. So Paul meets this couple through work, tent making or leather working, and they offer him a place to stay as well. And I think there's something here for us as well. Like when, when things aren't going well, or having a rough time, when we're discouraged, I think sometimes the temptation is to sit and scroll or to self-isolate and self-medicate. But when Paul, while Paul is sad and beat up and discouraged and downcast, he works with his hands and talks with his friends. Like sweat it out and talk it out. God created us to work and to relate. And not workaholism, sometimes that's some of our temptation, but fruitfulness. And for those of us with sedentary jobs like me, uh, finding ways to, 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 to sweat with friends. I think about some of those late night conversations the three of them would have had around the fire, dead tired from work, but not wanting to go to bed because of the laughter, the stories, sharing some heartache. Check out what Paul will say about these two friends in Romans 16, three. Uh, give my greetings to Prissa or Priscilla and Aquila, my coworkers in Christ Jesus, who risk their own necks for my life. Not only do I thank them, but so do all the Gentile churches. So this couple was incredible, and somehow they risked their lives for Paul, and he's just so indebted to them. Acts 18, verse 4, Paul reasoned in the synagogues every Sabbath and tried to persuade both Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul devoted himself to preaching the word and testified to the Jews that Jesus is the Messiah. When they resisted and blasphemed, he shook out his clothes and told them, your blood is on your own heads. I am innocent. From now on, I'll go to the Gentiles. So he left there and went to the house of a man named Titus Justus, a worshiper of God whose house was next door to the synagogue. Crispus, the leader of the synagogue, believed in the Lord along with his whole household. Many of the Corinthians, when they heard, believed and were baptized. The Lord said to Paul in a night vision, don't be afraid, but keep on speaking and don't be silent for I am with you. And no one will lay a hand on you to hurt you, because I have many people in this city. He stayed there a year and a half, teaching the word of God among them. So things are looking really promising for the church in Corinth. Verse 8 told us many Corinthians, when they heard, they believed and they were baptized. And then the Lord, probably Jesus himself, shows up to Paul again in a, in a dream or a night vision. He says, hey, Paul, don't be afraid. I'm with you. I have many people in this city. And after this initial success and this encouragement from Jesus himself, Paul stays in Corinth for 18 months. That's the longest he's stayed anywhere in any of his missionary travels up until this point. So Paul probably sees Corinth as his most important mission yet. It seems like in this city, his Jewish opponents don't have a lot of power. It's kind of funny, maybe some of you noticed this, that when Paul gets kicked out of the synagogue, did you see where he goes next, where he sets up his ministry base of operations? Acts 18, verse 7, Justice's house, who lives right next door to the synagogue. <laughs> like, it'd be like getting fired from the pizza joint and starting a new pizza joint right next to it. Like, that's kind of what Paul does. He, he, he starts uh, his ministry in the, the, the right next door in the adjacent building. Uh, we know Paul has his kind of ornery, provocative side. We'll see that about him. The Jewish leaders get so frustrated that they beat up one of their own uh, in Acts 18, 17. A synagogue leader named Sosthenes, maybe they thought he was a little soft on Paul. Maybe they thought he was a little too open to what Paul had to say, and so they beat him up. Now, what's interesting is in 1 Corinthians 1, 1, when Paul greets the Corinthian church, he says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by God's will, and Sosthenes, our brother. Now, we can't know for sure because Sosthenes is not an uncommon name, but it's possible that this is the same Sosthenes, the former synagogue leader who got beat up. So after this, maybe he joins Paul, maybe he just goes all the way and, and becomes a Christian and joins the new Jesus followers. So things are looking promising in Corinth uh, it's exciting. They're in a strategic, urban, massive, uh, multicultural city. The church plants off the ground. 
Uh, if the gospel could take root here, it could spread all throughout the Roman Empire, all throughout the world. Corinth could be one of Paul's greatest achievements. But, but, how many of you have lived long enough to know that expectations are almost always tempered by reality? Things are going to get really difficult. After Paul leaves, uh, he hears things about Corinth that really disturb him. Like, like, he hears that they're having lots and lots of problems. And so he writes letters to get to the bottom of what's going on. And they have this email correspondence, if you will. Um, in fact, First and Second Corinthians in our Bibles are only a couple letters uh, that we still have out of many. And there's actually uh, at least four. So I, I put, put them on the screen here for you. So there's the first letter, which is referenced in 1 Corinthians 5.9. And uh, it seems to be some questions about sexual immorality, and it doesn't go well. The Corinthians misunderstand it. Then the second letter is actually 1 Corinthians, so that's confusing, right? But, um, and, and that one doesn't seem to go well. So then Paul writes a severe letter, or the, the letter of tears, and that's referenced in 2 Corinthians 2.4. And then, and that actually seems to go pretty well, interestingly enough, and then 2 Corinthians. So... This takes a lot of time for Paul. Uh, far from uh, Paul's greatest success, success story, uh, this is, Corinth is going to be his biggest headache and his biggest heartache. Now, uh, some of you guys know that as we start new series, I like to show you the Bible Project videos. Bible Project is an excellent organization that is incredible. It condenses like a year of seminary into one short video. So I'm going to show you a video of what kind of the, the breakdown of 1 Corinthians, and it'll show us kind of all the problems they were facing and how Paul addresses those with the gospel. So get comfortable, and let's watch this uh, Bible Project overview. Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, written to a church community that Paul knew really well. Corinth was a major port city in the ancient world and had lots of temples to Greek and Roman gods. It was a big economic center. And so Paul strategically came here as a missionary. He spent a year and a half there getting to know people, talking to them about Jesus. And a whole bunch of people became followers of Jesus and formed a church community. You can read about all of this in Acts chapter 18. So after a while, Paul moved on to start churches in other cities, and he started getting reports that things were not going well at all back at the church in Corinth. It was plagued by all kinds of problems, and that's why he wrote this letter. It's broken up into five main parts, along with a final greeting. And these five sections correspond to five main problems that Paul is addressing. And so the letter reads like a collection of short essays on different topics, but there are these core ideas that unite all of the pieces together. So here's what he does in each section. He describes the problem, but then he always responds to that problem with some part of the story of the gospel, which is the good news about Jesus. And he shows how they're actually not living out what they say they believe. And so this letter is all about learning to think about every area of life through the lens of the gospel. So let's dive in and see how he does it. In chapters one through four, the problem is that there are these divisions in the church. There are some other teachers who had come through town since Paul left, a guy named Apollos and then Peter, and people had picked their favorite teacher and then became groupies around that leader and then started to talk bad and disrespect people who favored another leader or teacher. And so Paul, his response to this is kind of sarcastic and sharp. He says, you have to be kidding me, right? The church is not a popularity contest. The church is a community of people who are centered around Jesus. Its leaders and its teachers are simply servants of Jesus. So while you might prefer one leader more than another, it's not worth dividing over and certainly not speaking poorly about each other. The center of the church is Jesus and the good news about who he is and what he's done. In chapters 5 through 7, Paul addresses some problems related to sex. There were a number of people sleeping around in the church. One guy with his stepmother a number of other people still worshiping at the local temples to Greek gods and sleeping with the prostitutes who worked there. Not only that, but there were people in the church who were saying that this was all just fine. They said, hey, we're free in Christ. God's grace is bottomless, right? It's fine. Paul says it's not fine. 
And with the gospel in hand, he shows just how wrong-headed this kind of thinking is. He says, remember, first of all, Jesus died for your sins, including the ruin of broken relationships that's caused by sexual misconduct. And so if you're a Christian, sexual integrity is one of the main ways that we respond to Jesus' love and grace. Paul also reminds them that just as Jesus was physically raised from the dead, so our bodies will be raised from the dead, which means this. If your body is being redeemed by Jesus now and in the future, then what you do with your body matters. It matters a lot. And it's not yours to do whatever you want with. Paul's being super clear. Being a follower of Jesus involves no compromise when it comes to sexual integrity. In chapters 8 through 10, the issue is about food, but not just food preferences, like do you like or dislike a certain food. The issue the Corinthians were divided over is meat that came from animals sacrificed in the local temples to Greek and Roman gods. And there was a split between the Jewish and non-Jewish Christians about how to respond to this issue. And once again, Paul appeals to some core ideas from the gospel. He says, our allegiance, first and foremost, is to Jesus as Lord, not to any other gods. And so if you're in a situation where there's meat that's been dedicated to another god, And there are people around who might watch you and conclude, oh, look, hey, Christians worship Jesus and they can worship other gods too. Paul says, if that's the scenario, don't eat the meat. Your loyalty is to Jesus and you should love those people more than yourself and not mislead them. But Paul quickly qualifies this and says, listen, as Christians, we believe God is the creator of all things, including that animal. And the temple idols, we believe, are just pieces of wood and stone. So if there's no one around who's going to misunderstand your actions and you're hungry, eat up. You're free as a new human in Christ to follow your conscience in these kind of debatable matters. So what makes it okay in one situation to eat, but not in the other? The core principle is love. Love will deny itself and look out for the well-being of other people. And love, God's love, is at the core of the gospel. It's what Jesus did when he died for us. And so Paul says it's what Christians should do for other people. In chapters 11 through 14, Paul moves on and addresses problems in their weekly worship gathering. There were some people who were having really powerful spiritual experiences in the gathering. And so they would start praying out loud in unknown languages. There were other people who might start sharing a teaching or a word from God, and then someone would get up and interrupt them because they wanted to share. And it all was really chaotic, and it was distracting people, especially visitors, from hearing the gospel. So in these chapters, Paul helps them think, first of all, about the purpose of this gathering to help them see what kind of behaviors are appropriate. He says the gathering is a place where God's spirit should be working through everybody and it should happen in a unified way. So he develops this cool metaphor about the church as a human body. It's one, but it has all these different parts and each part serves a unique and important role. So he goes on to name a whole bunch of things that the spirit does through all these different people, all for the building up of the church. That's a key phrase in these chapters. And Paul concludes that the highest value in the gathering should be a concept central to the gospel, God's love. And love is a key word in these chapters too. Love will compel each person in the gathering to use their role to serve and seek the well-being of others. So Paul applies all this to the Corinthians' problems. Some people think the purpose of the gathering is to have intense spiritual experiences or to get a chance to speak their mind. And and Paul says, listen, I'm a big fan of powerful experiences of prayer, but if it distracts other people or freaks them out, I should stop it because I'm loving myself more than I'm loving those people. The gathering around Jesus should be orderly so everybody can learn and sing and worship and hear God speaking to them. The last problem Paul addresses is the issue of Jesus' resurrection and the future hope of Jesus' followers. There were some people in the church who were saying that the idea of resurrection is ridiculous and doesn't really matter to being a Christian. And Paul reacts to this big time. He begins by saying that the resurrection is an indispensable part of the gospel. We believe in it because of the hundreds of eyewitnesses that saw Jesus alive in a physical body after being publicly executed by the Romans. If Jesus didn't rise from the dead, Paul says, then his death was meaningless. We are all still lost in our sin and selfishness. We should just stop being Christians. 
Paul then shows in detail how the resurrection was Jesus' victory over death and evil, how it's a source of life and power for us now and the present, and how it's a promise of future hope for the whole world. It's because of the resurrection that we have a reason to be unified around Jesus. It's the reason we have motivation for sexual integrity. It's the source of power for loving other people more than ourselves. And ultimately, it's our hope for victory over death. And so, Paul concludes, we do believe Jesus was raised from the dead, which means this. The gospel is not just moral advice or a recipe for private spirituality. It's an announcement about Jesus that opens up a whole new reality. And that's what 1 Corinthians is all about, seeing every part of life through the lens of that gospel. Pretty incredible, huh? Those guys are amazing. Seeing every part of life through the lens of the gospel. And he says the gospel is an announcement about Jesus that opens up a new reality. The Corinthian church had tons of problems, and we're going to, as we saw and as we'll continue to see, division, sexual confusion, idolatry, harmful cultural compromise, nothing we see today, right? We probably all experienced dysfunctional church, we probably all participated in or contributed to dysfunctional church. Lots of people have left the church over the past several decades, uh, not just River Valley, but every church. And many of them point to these things, these problems, these issues. I know for me, my happiest memories and my closest relationships have been in the context of the church. And my saddest and most difficult, most painful times have been in the context of, of church. And maybe that's true for many of you. Church has always had lots of problems because the church is people. Uh, There was never any kind of golden age that we need to get back to. Not the early church, as we'll see in 1 Corinthians. Uh, Not Calvin's Geneva. Not the 1950s. There is no golden age. We've always had problems, which might be like discouraging or it might be comforting. We've always had problems, but God's always committed to working with messed up people ever since Genesis 3. So I humbly suggest, and of course I'm biased, but that the the solution to messy church, the solution to toxic, ugly, harmful, problematic, painful church is not no church, but better church, healthy church. And Paul shows us that this is his aim with Corinth. Even with all their problems, Paul doesn't just start there. He doesn't open the letter there. He's not going to ignore what's going on because to fix things, you have to face them. But check out how Paul opens this difficult letter real quick. 1 Corinthians 1, 1 through 9. Paul called an apostle of Jesus Christ by God's will and Sosthenes, our beat up brother, (laughs) to the church of God at Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus called as saints with all those in every place who call in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both their Lord and our Lord's grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I always thank my God because of you, for you, because of the gospel of God given to you in Christ Jesus, that you were enriched in him in every way, in all speech and all knowledge. In this way, the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you, so that you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. He will also strengthen you to the end so that you will be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful. You were called by him into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. So what do we see here? Uh, What does Paul show us about what better church might look like? Real quick, I'm gonna give us four things. Uh, First, better church is Christ-focused. In these nine verses, Christ is mentioned explicitly nine times. Uh, Ten times if you count the hymn of verse 5. Christ is literally in every sentence, in every verse of this introduction. It's all about Jesus. He's absolutely central. And there's always the temptation to make something else the focus. In Corinth, it was spiritual gifts. Who's the best speaker? Who has the most knowledge? Who has the most wisdom? Good things, but not the most important things. In America, the church might be tempted to make patriotism or partisan politics or social justice or culture war stuff, to to make that the most important 
things or to make money or influence or relevance or likability the main things. Church sometimes is tempted to make certain types of sin the main focus, particularly the ones that I don't struggle with, right? A kind of moral superiority. We can make our preferences, priorities, pet projects, our passions, the, the, the minist- the, our ministry, we can make that the center, which really I think is when we make the church about us, when we're the center of it. It reminds me of the time someone approached one of our elders during a worship song, and uh, this person said, I don't like this song. And the elder responded, "Uh, that's okay. It wasn't written for you. (laughs) It wasn't written to you. It's not about you. It's about Jesus. Now, why is a central Christ good news for us? Because any of those other things cannot handle the weight of our worship. Any of those other things can't handle being central or primary or most important. Only Christ is compelling enough for us to come back week after week to continue to worship. It's definitely not me. It's not our awesome worship team. It's not the awesome Bible project. It's all about Jesus. Only Christ will outlast everything else. Scottish pastor Robert Murray McShane uh, has this great quote, and it's something like this. For every one look at yourself, take 10 looks at Christ. So for every one look at yourself, your your sin, your failures, your issues, problems, trials, take 10 looks at Christ. For every one look at the problems in the church that dominate a lot of our attention, problems in the world, problems in our culture, your family, Take 10 looks at Christ. Or say things are going really well for you. Like you're thriving, you're successful. Like great for every one look at yourself and your success and your prosperity, the work of your hands. Take 10 looks at Christ. It's all about him. So better church is gonna be Christ-focused. Better church is also gonna be full of grace and peace. In all of Paul's letters, even Galatians, He begins with the phrase grace to you and peace. And sometimes he'll add the word mercy as well. Uh, Paul takes the standard Greek word for greetings, greetings, and he changes like one or two letters and it becomes the word grace. So instead of greetings to you, he says grace to you. And then he adds the standard Hebrew greeting, which is the word shalom, peace, wholeness, well-being, health, Uh, And that's Paul's entire theological program, grace and peace. Gordon Fee says the sum total of all God's activity towards human creatures is found in that one word, grace. God gives himself to us and for us in Christ, excessively, abundantly, completely, 100% free. And if you're not clear on the Christian message, friends, it's that God loves you. And Jesus died for you. He has a plan for you. And then the best word to describe all the benefits of what we receive in Jesus is the word peace. Shalom and wholeness. Well-being and completion. So grace and peace, uh, that's what we gather around. That's what we come together to enjoy and experience and then to embody, to, 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 to extend. So if our church, if our relationships, if our groups uh, are not characterized by grace and peace, we've lost sight of Jesus as the main thing. But when Jesus is central and we're saturated in grace and peace, uh, there's nothing better, right? That's a taste of heaven on earth, heaven breaking in. So better church is Christ-centered, it's full of grace and peace, and three, better church sees people like God sees them. Now, did you notice what Paul says about this headache church in verse three? To the church of God at Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called as saints. What does he call them? Saints? Holy ones? I would have probably used a different adjective than holy uh, or, or a different noun, right? Uh, you know, to the church of God at Corinth, called as headache. Right? 
to the church of God in Corinth, to those sinners in Christ Jesus. Or to the Corinthian church. Yeah, you selfish ones. You arrogant punks. That's what I would have said. But Paul defines them by what God says about them. Not by what he's experiencing in that present moment. What does God say about them? Jesus died for them in the past. They're a work of progress in the present. And they're going to be something incredible in the future. Paul says, I'm writing to the saints, which is every person who's received Jesus. It's not just the super spiritual people like Mother Teresa. Every Christian is a saint, a holy one. I think one of the most powerful prayers in my life right now, especially when it comes to people who kind of grate on me, is, Lord, help me to see that person like you see them. How do you view this person, Lord? Like, what's your perspective on them? How do you, how do you see this person? And it's incredibly, it, it softened my heart immensely and reframes my view of them. None of you, of course, right? It's really interesting. In, in 1 Corinthians, Paul gives gratitude for God, for the Corinthian church, and he says in, in verse 7, you were enriched in him in every way, in all speech and knowledge. Speech and knowledge. We're going to see in this series that these are precisely the things that the Corinthians are having the biggest issues with. These are their problems. Uh, Verse 7 as well, Paul mentions spiritual gifts positively. And this church was misusing knowledge, misusing speech, and misusing uh, spiritual gifts. These are the things that cause Paul the biggest headaches, the most grief, the sleepless nights, And these are the things he's thanking God for. What's up with that? Is Paul delusional? Is he one of those naive optimists, glasses always half full? Or is he just like a complete pessimist, cynical, uh, ironic, hey, Corinthians, I'm really thankful for the way you're tearing each other apart. Well done. Bless your heart. I think there's some irony in play here. Paul can be ironic, like when he goes to the house next to the synagogue, but I think it's more significant than that. I think Paul sees legitimate strengths which are getting used in illegitimate ways. I wonder if sometimes our biggest issues aren't our weaknesses. There are strengths that we misuse and misapply and and, and use and abuse. What if, to reframe, what if the weaknesses, the perceived weaknesses in your children, in your spouse, in your friends, in your family members, coworkers, stems from a place of misapplied, misdirected, misunderstood strengths? What if you were able to affirm that strength while helping them see the destructive way that they're using their strengths? Maybe that person who's really, really critical has like a really high view of excellence and they're really hardworking. Maybe that person who's always late is really relational and takes time to really be with people. Uh, Maybe that person who's really quiet is an incredible thinker. Maybe our perceived weaknesses are strengths that need some coaching and some spirit-inspired guidance. I think we'll see that with the Corinthians. Well, fourth and finally, and as the worship team comes back up, better church prioritizes prayer. So Paul starts this letter of problems with prayer. Grateful, thankful prayer. I mean, it sounds so cliche, doesn't it? But what if we, instead of jumping into our problems, started with prayer? Uh, What if we prayed before we checked our phones in the morning? Uh, What if we prayed before tackling that project or problem? Why? Why? Well, because we align ourselves with God and what he's up to. We get his heart on the situation. We fill our hearts with the goodness of God and let that frame the problems of people and not the other way around. The Christian, the church, the group, the people that don't pray much demonstrate that we don't feel like we need God much. Not in any deep or desperate kind of way. But like Paul shows us, to start with thankful prayers to get our hearts right. Maybe someone's being foolish. Maybe there's dissension. Maybe there's problems. And we might wonder, why is this person being this way? What in the world is this person doing? 
But what if we reframed it again? What if the question isn't first, what is this person doing? But what if it's, what is God doing? What's God up to in this circumstance, problem, tension, struggle? What's the spirit doing? Maybe out of this conflict, iron will sharpen iron. Maybe out of the Corinthian mess will come the Corinthian letters that billions of Christians have gotten to enjoy and benefit from. Maybe out of all the problems will come a lot more prayer. Maybe out of death will come resurrection. Actually, not maybe. Definitely. Definitely. Let's pray. Lord, we want to be a better church. Not better than anyone else. Not morally superior, but healthier. Now, we want to be a healthy church, a healthy community that reflects you, that puts you first. Because we know when you're first, we thrive most. So, Father, thank you for the ways you're at work uh, in us and in our church, and we ask for more. In Jesus' name, amen.